Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 17 of Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now, um, this is interesting because the Lord is speaking to the angel of the church of Pergamos. And we've uh, read in a previous verse that Satan had a seat there. Well, now the Lord is getting more specific. And he is saying that he has a few things against thee. That is, that there are those in the churches, in the congregations, during the church age, that held the doctrine of Balaam, and then God explains what that is, who taught Balak to cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Well, this is, uh, this is interesting and, and also unusual that the Lord is referring back to Balaam, Balaam, an Old Testament character who lived many hundreds of years ago. He, he lived at a time when Israel came out of Egypt and at the point in history when they approached the nation of Moab. And yet God is harking back to the doctrine of Balaam and indicating this doctrine is present in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the New Testament churches and congregations, in the, uh, in the corporate body, that there are individuals who are holding to that doctrine. And it's a horrible thing uh, that, that the Lord is pointing out. And that's why uh, he has these things, these few things against them. There's nothing good about this. Balaam is a man that we read of, uh, as I mentioned, in the Old Testament. And surprisingly, he, his name is mentioned 63 times in the Bible. That's uh, a good number of times for someone who was a false prophet. And we'll see, there's no doubt about that. Um, occasionally people uh, are, are a little... Uh, confused because he seems for a period of time to want to do the Lord's will. Yet the Bible is very clear on the matter of Balaam that he was a false prophet. We'll, we'll look at uh, verses that definitely reveal that. Now of those 63 times, over 50 references to Balaam are found in the book of Numbers. And that's where we're going to turn in order to learn about Balaam. And we need to learn about him to find out uh, what that doctrine is. And, and then we'll understand why God is bringing it up uh, for the New Testament churches and congregations. Now let's go back to the book of Numbers and turn to Numbers chapter 22. And um, in Numbers 22, through actually chapters 23 and 24, Balaam is the main topic that the Lord is focused on. And, and by the way, the name Balaam seems to mean not of the people. And uh, that, that's probably a reference to the fact that he was not a Jew, not of the tribe of Israel. Uh, he he was a foreigner, born in another land, and, and so his name means not of the people. Uh, spiritually, uh, that would indicate he is not of God's elect. He, his name was not written in Lamb's Book of Life. He is someone who has association with God. He has some dealings with the Lord, but he was never a saved man at all. Well, in Numbers 22, 
uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure, I shall prevail that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I what? That he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam, and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as Jehovah shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam, and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land. For Jehovah refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak, and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. Now let's stop here uh, for a minute and consider what we just read. Here we find that the Moabites are afraid of the Israelites. The Israelites, um, their reputation has preceded them. They destroyed the mighty army of Egypt in coming out of Egypt. And at this time, uh, they had also won a battle against the Amorites. And, and so the Moabites were sore afraid. And what were they to do? They didn't know what to do. And so it's um, determined that they will send for Balaam, a soothsayer who will curse Israel. Because after all, they're, they're probably reasoning, this uh, is a spiritual matter. They, they have God on their side. He's the one who uh, did those mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. And, and so we need um, God on our side. And it was thought that Balaam had a good relationship with, with God, and from our first encounter with Balaam, well, we would say this man sounds faithful. He, he didn't know what the um, embassage from the king of Moab wanted. He, he didn't know he, who these Israelites were, um, as far as, as we're aware. And so he rightly takes the matter to Jehovah. He even uses the name Jehovah. So we we have some hope that this Balaam is a, a good man because when he does go to the Lord and the Lord actually communicates with him, which is a, another plus, we would think, that God is communicating with Balaam. And the Lord tells him, do not go with them. Uh, you will not curse the people. They are blessed. And Balaam listens to what Jehovah had said to him, and he tells the princes of, of Balak, of the princes of Moab, get you into your land. 
Jehovah refuses to give me leave to go with you. And then those princes rose up and returned to, to Balak, giving him that word that Balaam refused to come. And if Balaam had left the matter right here, or if um, the Moabites did not tempt him any further, uh, if he was not tried uh, additionally to the degree he already had been, then we would walk away thinking Balaam is a, a faithful prophet. He is a good man. He listens to the word of the Lord and he cannot be bought. He cannot be bribed with these things, that these rewards of divination. However, we, we know that the story does not end here. And eventually he will give in. That's why Second Peter chapter 2 says in verse 14 of false prophets, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Well, that's a condemnation from the Lord of Balaam. It also says in the book of Jude, in Jude, verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Well, again, God is emphasizing that Balaam did go after the reward, but not at first, not initially. Uh, he, he stood strong. He went to the Lord. He did everything correctly from what we can tell. But as we all should be aware, if there is a weakness in us, well, that weakness uh, will be prodded. God will arrange circumstances and allow events to unfold so that uh, we are tested and tested again if that weakness has to really do with the the weakness of an unchanged heart if that is the problem that lies within us well the lord will not let us continue on in a condition thinking that we are his people that's one of the reasons why he is severely trying and testing us now he is checking the hearts of men checking the hearts of those that proclaim to be his people and now it was the time for Balaam's test. And in verse 15 of Numbers 22, it goes on to say, And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. Well, you see, if uh, the princes weren't enough, if they weren't honorable enough, well, let's just send more. It's still hitting the same point the the weakness is in this area. God knows it, um, and maybe others know it too. We don't know the whole story here. God's just giving us a bit of information. But it could have been known that Balaam would work for hire in this way. And, and so the Lord is allowing these things to happen and to uh, increase in their intensity. It goes on to say in verse 16, And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of Jehovah my God to do less or more. Again, he sounds faithful. He's, he's holding fast the word of the Lord. He's doing right. But let's keep reading. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what Jehovah will say unto me more. 
now we, we see a problem, or we should. God has told him clearly, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And by the way, that last part, Balaam forgot to mention to those princes. He didn't tell them that God said they are blessed. And after that clear statement of the Lord concerning this job offer, that he is not to go, he is not to curse this people, they are blessed. Well, why would Balaam once again go to the Lord asking him what he should do? Uh, You know, sometimes uh, we're very deceitful. Man is very deceitful, especially when it comes to religious things or spiritual matters and our dealings with God. And if we happen to be an unsaved person, well, our heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, and there's no change in that heart, and we really have no relationship with God, we uh, probably manipulate things in our life. Uh, As far as a professed relationship with him, we actually would be the ones controlling certain things concerning a so-called relationship between ourselves and God if if we say we're saved and in, and in fact we're not. And so here Balaam is going to the Lord because he has gotten a greater offer. More money, more honor, more prestige. And, and so he goes back to the Lord to find out well, now, uh, it, 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 can I go? Can I go? And, and why would he think that any of the things that God had said would change? Why would God allow him to curse the people when God emphatically said, Thou shall not curse them, for they are blessed? It is only out of a desire for the rewards of divination, out of a deceitful heart, that Balaam returns back to the Lord. It's similar to, let, let's put this in terms we can understand. We have learned from the Bible, for instance, that we are not to get divorced. We, we are not to get divorced for any reason. And, and yet here's a man in a relationship, and he understands this particular truth. He has heard the teaching from the Bible and agreed with it. Yes, yes, I I see this. I understand this. But as time goes on and as his marriage gets more difficult and as he happens to meet another individual, a woman that he has interest in, he turns back to the Bible and looks at the verses again And now, why? Why is he doing this? Because it's just like Balaam going back, trying to find a loophole, find a way that he can do what he wants to do so that he can have his own desire. And just as with Balaam, God permitted Balaam. It says here in uh, Numbers 22, in verse 20, and God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And that's exactly what God does when someone has it in their mind. They're, they're bent on doing something. They want their will to be done. And so as they come back to the Bible, they see things in a different light. Oh, here's, here's a verse except for fornication. That means that now they begin to think, well, there could be divorce for certain reasons. And then they take that. Of course, there was no fornication in their marriage. And actually, it's not an allowance. God doesn't permit that. But 
But even if someone misunderstood that, it, it doesn't allow for divorce for any reason, which basically uh, we've come to that point. And so they, they're trying to get permission, trying to get allowance. And God does allow them as he'll remove his hand of restraint from their sinful desire in this area and permit them to get divorced or permit the man to proceed with his wicked desire, with his evil wish, and he gets the divorce, and then he um, ends up remarrying this other person, and, oh, the Lord has blessed me with a new wife. Oh, no, he hasn't. There's no blessing involved at all. God has simply allowed you to go down an evil road, to go down the wrong way, to do things that are not pleasing in his sight at all. And that's exactly what happened with Balaam as we read in verse 22 of Numbers chapter 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. Well, hold it. Didn't the Lord allow him? Yes. And there is a permissive will of God. That is, God recognizes the sinfulness of man, the rebellious nature of mankind, and, uh, and, and he restrains sin. He's done this all through history. Of course, in times past to a greater degree, he, but he restrains the, the sinful uh, wants of man. And he's done this to allow mankind to function, to have some ability to live in this world and to live their lives in a somewhat moral and decent way. And, and God, out of his goodness, has uh, withheld man from greatly sinning against him. But we come to our day, and of course that hand of restraint is lifted more and more more and more there's still some hand of restraint or or there would just be total chaos as mankind would devour one another but as we uh, hear the news we know uh, that these types of things have never happened to the degree they're happening now all over the earth yes god has allowed men's hearts to wax cold uh, to a point that has never been reached before and and even though god allows man and permits man to do what comes natural to man it does not mean that it was according to the will of god god's will is made known in the bible his commandments are uh, an expression of his will for each person if we want to know how to live what we are to do with our life today and tomorrow and every day we're alive. We read the Bible and God instructs us and guides us and tells us every step of the way. Here is the path that you may try. This is the way you may walk. You may do these things. You may be kind and gentle and loving and you may do these good things, but you may not do these other things. These are wicked and evil. They, they are contrary to my law. Now, it's only because man is naturally evil that he feels these laws are constraining. They're, they're too tight uh, around him. They suffocate him. He, he feels no pleasure perhaps, in uh, adhering to the commandments of God. Uh, he wants freedom. And of course, freedom to the sinner is freedom to sin. And because uh, he is not good but evil, there is none good, the Bible says, he finds no freedom in the fact that God permits him to do all the good that his heart could ever desire to do or all the good he could imagine to do. We're free to do good, to do well. We're free to love, and, and we could do uh, works and thoughts and deeds in that area, 
and God would commend us and and there would be blessing and and there are there is no law against uh, the many good things that we could potentially do. The only problem is that man's mind does not work in that direction. We don't think naturally good things. We don't do naturally good things. We think evil thoughts continually. We do things that are contrary to the law of God. We have little interest in doing things that are in agreement with the law of God. And and that's why uh, so many people feel confined and, and trapped by law. The, they're in their marriage, and the Bible says you're not to divorce. Oh, but I want to... Uh, I want to explore. I want to do other things and meet other people. What you want to do is sin. You want to do what comes naturally. You want to uh, commit adultery. And you don't want to do that which is good. This is the problem with mankind. And so God permits man to do these things in a permissive way as he just simply lifts his hand of restraint from us and we run after evil. And that's what he did with Balaam. He permitted Balaam to go with these princes of Moab to Balak in order that he might receive the reward of divination. It was nothing but pure evil. And Balaam has fallen from that uh, position that we initially might have thought of him, that he was a faithful man. Oh, no, there's nothing faithful at all about Balaam.